Recently, I was lucky enough to head out to Gran Canaria in the Canary Islands to ride Pivot's brand new Switchblade. Now, their Switchblade looks to blur the lines between trail and enduro. With progressive geometry, 142 millimeters of bump busting travel and compatibility for both 29 and 27.5 inch plus tires. The 2020 Switchblade's front and rear triangles are both made from Pivot's special hollow core carbon fiber. Manufacturers tend to have lots of fancy names for the different carbon fiber layout processes they use to build their bikes. But in short, Pivot's hollow core carbon fiber uses a foam internal construction that draws a vacuum between the layers of carbon fiber to help smooth out the interior of the bike's frames. Pivot claims that this carbon fiber layout process helps to improve frame strength, increase their tolerances, and help save weight. Pivot's new switchblade has size-specific carbon layups. Now, they told me that this means a small bike should have the same ride characteristics as a large or extra large bike because what they've done is remove material from the smaller frame and added it to the larger frame so that they can anticipate the weight of riders riding one size over another and hopefully both the bikes will feel the same. This size specific layup, however, is unique to the front triangle. The rear triangle across all sizes is the same. Pivot also told me that they wanted the rear triangle to be as stiff as possible. Now they've done this using the two vertical structures that go between the chain and seat stays, and also by increasing the width of the DW link pivot at the bottom of the bike. For those of you wondering what the DW link is, I'll talk about that in a moment. The rear end of the bike is compatible with 2.8 inch wide, 27.5 inch plus tires, and 2.6 inch wide 29er tires. The swing arm has got built in ribbed chainstay protection to help reduce chain slap. There are water bottle mounts inside the front triangle and there's enough room even on the smallest size to fit a full size water bottle. There's also a secondary bottle mount system underneath the top of the top tube. Now this can either support a Fox live valve system, or you can mount a pump or something else under there. The bike's got full length internally routed cables that enter at the head tube and exit at the dropouts. Pivot's cable port system clamps the cables where they enter and exit the frame in a bid to help reduce cable rattle. The frame's got ISCG 05 chain guide mounts and is compatible with up to a 36 tooth chain link. Because Pivot hopes this bike should blur the lines between trail and enduro, it has fairly progressive geometry. The bike's got two geometry settings, a high and a low. In the low setting, it's got a 66 degree head angle and a 75.5 degree seat tube angle. It's also got 431 millimeter chainstays, 1,216 millimeter wheelbase, and a 470 millimeter reach for the size large. Between the high and low setting, the head angle and seat tube angle change by 0.5 degrees and the bottom bracket changes by 6 millimeters. For the full geometry lowdown, check out the first ride review on bikeradar.com. There's a link to this review in the video description. Now onto the bike suspension. The 142 millimeters of travel is controlled by a DW Link system. The DW Link suspension system is renowned for some specific claimed traits, like stroke sensitive anti squat, not much pedal bob, and an optimized pivot for the best suspension curve. With these claims in mind, I was pretty excited to swing a leg over the switchblade. The new switchblade is fitted with Fox's DPX2 shock that's been designed and tuned specifically for the Switchblade's suspension system. When designing the DPX2 for the Switchblade, they hoped that it would be able to give the bike better off-the-top suspension compliance 
with loads of ramp up towards the end of the travel. Now the DPX2 is an air sprung shock but Pivot also told me that the new switchblade is compatible with coil shocks as well. The bike I rode was the Team XTR build with 29 inch wheels in the low setting. Now this model was pretty much at the top of the switchblade range. This model costs a whopping £9,000 or $8,999. Now that is an awful lot of money for anyone. So what parts are spec on the bike for this amount of cash? Well, up front, you get the Fox 36 Grip 2 damper with Kashima coated stanchions. You get a DPX2 rear shock with a Kashima stanchion as well and a Fox transfer dropper post with the Kashima stanchion. Surprise, surprise. A clue for the rest of the spec is given in the bike's name, XTR. There's an XTR 12-speed drivetrain with XTR four-piston brakes. Interestingly, Pivot has swapped out the XTR cranks for a set of Raceface Next R carbon cranks instead. The wheels on this model are made by Reynolds and it's the black label model laced onto Industry 9 hubs. The wheels are wrapped in Maxxis rubber with a Minion DHF on the front and a Minion DHR2 out the back. Pivot are also dabbling into the finishing component market and attached to the bike was a set of carbon fiber pivot handlebars, pivot handlebar grips and a WTB pivot branded saddle. It was possible to draw some initial conclusions with my time on the Switchblade in Gran Canaria. The tracks out there were incredibly rocky, dry and dusty. A lot of them old walkers paths with long straights into 180 degree hairpin turns. There were also some more mountain bike specific trails with built berms, jumps and drops. One thing did remain common across all of the types of trail I rode out there and that was the ferocity of the rocks and the bumps. It's fair to say the bike got a real thrashing, despite me not riding at 100%. As I said earlier, Pivot hopes that the new switchblade will blur the lines between trail and enduro. So have they managed to create a bike that can do this? Well, in short, kind of, and I was pretty impressed with the bike. However, there were one or two things that could have been done a bit better. Pedaling uphill, the first thing I noticed was that this bike doesn't climb like a short travel trail bike. Now that's not necessarily a great thing. In fact, I found it climbed more like a 160 mm travel enduro bike. It's certainly worth saying though that the bike didn't feel sluggish and the XTR build that I was riding is one of the lightest in the bike's range. So if you go for a cheaper, lower spec bike, this problem is only gonna be more accentuated. And despite the relatively steep 75.5 degree seat tube angle, I did still nose the seat down as far as it would go and push it forwards in the rails on the seat clamp. Now this means that the seat tube angle could be steeper still. On flat, smooth sections of trail that are suited to high cadence pedaling, I did notice that there was some pedal bob on the bike. However, the climb switch on the Fox DPX2 rear shock did all but eliminate the pedal bob. The trade-off for using this climb switch is that the rear shock isn't as supple and on rougher sections you can lose grip and it's not as comfortable. Unsurprisingly, the 12-speed XTR drivetrain shifted impeccably. And the 32 tooth chainring matched with the 51 tooth biggest cassette cog meant that there were plenty of gears on offer. It's on the descents, however, that the switchblade really comes alive. The suspension's particularly supple at the beginning of the stroke and has loads of ramp up towards the end. And what this does is give an overriding feeling of confidence on the trails. The way the suspension worked meant it was possible to ride confidently through rock-strewn chunder. The suspension worked over time to iron out all of those bumps and I never felt like it choked on successive repeated hits. Obviously, with only 142 millimeters of travel, when things got really mental, it did start to lose a bit of composure. 
When it did get out of shape, the back wheel lost grip, but I wasn't pitched forwards or backwards on the bike when I wasn't expecting it. However, without trying a longer travel bike on the same trails in the same conditions, it's impossible to say what was causing the rear end to lose grip, whether it was the suspension tune, the lack of travel, or something else. On trails where I wanted to push hard through corners and up the takeoffs of jumps, the mid-stroke and bottom-out support given by the rear shock was great. This support really translates to a confidence-inspiring feeling on the bike. However, with the stock 1.02 inch cubed volume spacer installed on the shock, it did feel like the rear end ramped up very quickly. This abrupt ramp up did mean that it was quite hard to access the last bit of travel on the bike's rear end. And during the testing period in Gran Canaria, the little O-ring on the shock shaft confirmed that I never bottomed out. That was despite my best efforts, although the hard setup for all of the rocky terrain out there could have played a factor here as well. Although the specially designed DPX2 shock for the Switchblade felt great, I do feel that it would have been better with Fox's X2 shock that offers more adjustability. I appreciate that Pivot wanted to fit the DPX2 to this bike to differentiate it from their Firebird Enduro bike. However, the rest of the spec is pretty interchangeable with an Enduro bike, so I see no reason to fit a better performing X2 shock to the Switchblade. Overall, the geometry felt pretty good on the trails I rode. That said, I do think that the bike would reach its limits quite quickly if I was riding more extreme terrain. The Grip 2 Fox 36 impressed me, but there's no surprises there. It's an incredible fork and well done to Pivot for specking it on their bike. In the low bottom bracket setting, the bike has a 346 millimeter claimed bottom bracket height. Now this bottom bracket height is more commonly seen on longer travel enduro bikes. For this trail bike, that means it's actually quite high. I rode the bike before I knew what the bottom bracket measurement was, and I didn't really notice any untoward problems with how the bike cornered and the way it felt when I was riding. This to me means that the bottom bracket height in isolation shouldn't really be an issue because the rest of the bike's geometry works well together. There were a few moments of awkwardness, however. After long straights breaking into 180 degree hairpin corners, I did feel like the bike was teetering around a little bit. Now this could be down to the skittish terrain and the fact that I was hard on the brakes. But you know, it maybe does ask the question that is the bottom bracket slightly too high? Overall, it certainly feels like Pivot has nailed the way the switchblade feels. On rough, prolonged and hard descents, I didn't really get fatigued and I didn't notice any untoward vibrations coming up through the frame. The bike's compliance and smoothness has to be one of my favourite parts of the Switchblaze ride. Couple that with it never feeling too soft or too vague in the turns, I was really impressed with the way it handled all the terrain I could throw at it. It wasn't all rosy, however. The Shimano XTR brakes were a real disappointment for me. Despite the brakes feeling sharp and having a consistent bite point in the car park, when I set to the trail, that bite point just kept changing. Every time I went to squeeze the brakes, the bite point was in a different place. To top it off, the Ice Tech pads in the calipers rattled so bad the entire time when the brakes weren't being squeezed. One final thing that wasn't so good, and that was the internal cable routing. Now this could be down to a setup issue. So what happened was the cables are clamped where they enter and exit the frame. But if you have a bit of slack in the cable inside the frame, it can rattle against the inside of the tube when you're riding over rough terrain. This was a problem on my test bike, and no matter how much I fiddled around with it, I couldn't get the rattling to stop. First impressions certainly indicate that the new Switchblade is a punchy little bike with plenty of go that does a great job of bridging the gap between enduro and trail. This particular model is obscenely expensive, but it is loaded with top spec kit. However, some of that top spec kit doesn't perform as I expected it to, so it might be worth considering a slightly cheaper model in the range.
I definitely think that the geometry and the bike's travel don't hold it back. And I reckon that this bike will appeal to a lot of people who are looking for a one bike stable. Top work pivot. Are you somebody who would want one bike to do it all? And do you think the new Switchblade would be the right one for you? Let us know what you think in the comments. And don't forget to like and subscribe and click the little bell icon so you get a notification whenever we upload a new video.